If you've turned the TV on in the last couple of months, there's one topic on a lot of people's minds, inflation. In economics, inflation refers to the general increase in prices of goods and services in the economy. When the general price level increases, our money buys less and this is sometimes known as reduced purchasing power. In fact, I'm sure most of you know what inflation is, so what are we even doing here? Well there's a problem. How do you measure inflation when we're all individuals and we're all buying different things? If I bought a car last year, I might not buy one this year. Similarly, if I bought an electric vehicle, then the cost of fuel doesn't really impact me. One measure of inflation is the consumer price index, known as the CPI. And this is the index that's generally accepted to be the measure of inflation in the economy. But what you might not know is that many economists Think this measure tends to overstate inflation. And if that's the case, could all these doomsday articles about the inflation crisis be overdone? In this video, I'm going to share with you three problems with the CPI as a measure of inflation and what it means for the wider economy. So as I've already said, the CPI is one of the most closely followed measures of inflation. And as you probably also know, it's one of the major indexes the Federal Reserve uses when they meet to decide monetary policy policy, aka set the interest rates. It's also built into a number of contracts and some rent clauses will have a CPI annual review which puts the rent up to keep up with the increasing prices. It's also sometimes linked to social security benefits so that the elderly don't have a reduced standard of living. So there's a lot riding on this CPI thing, which you would think means it's very important to get it right, but it's not perfect. So let's jump into it. Problem number one is that people can substitute. The CPI measures the price difference between a fixed basket of goods in one period to the next. How else can they monitor the change from one period to the other? But consumers aren't fixed in what they purchase. If the price of something increases too much, they can simply substitute away from the high price good towards goods with relatively lower prices. Bloomberg actually had an article about this fairly recently suggesting that we should all just eat lentils. In reality, this is exactly what consumers can do. If the cost of living increases, consumers can substitute towards the lower price goods. In the lived reality, the cost of living can rise less rapidly than CPI. And this brings us to problem number two, how goods are introduced to the CPI. Economists generally agree that when a new good arrives on the market, consumers are better off because they have more choices. And indeed, increased competition helps to keep prices low. What this means is as new products are introduced, the real value of the dollar increases, but that increased purchasing power won't be found in the CPI. And finally, problem number three, which relates to the difficulty the CPI has when you try to account for changes in quality. If Tesla increased the horsepower of a particular model, the Bureau of Labor Statistics might try to account for the quality adjusted price of the car, so in reality the CPI should reflect the change and the quality adjusted price. But it's actually pretty hard in practice. For example, how do you accurately account for changes in comfort or safety? And if too many of these unmeasured quality improvements creep in, then the measured CPI rises faster than it should. Another quality change that's been thrown around lately is this idea of shrinkflation, where the packaging of the goods has been getting smaller, but prices have stayed relatively much the same. This is especially common in food. So you can see how these three measurement problems can produce an index that's actually removed from the lived reality of households. Naturally, the methodology is often changing and the error is probably reducing. The bias is thought to be less than 1%, which might not sound like a lot, but when so much is riding on this number, it's important to get it right. In any case, we can probably agree that the CPI tends to overstate inflation, but not as much as perhaps it used to. Thanks for tuning in. In. If you liked this short economic summary, make sure you check out these other videos on Market Mayhem, hit like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time.